Hello, my name is Peter Pettit. Welcome to New Paths for Engaging Israel. Engaging Israel, the thoughts compelling and the image is attractive. Whatever your image is of Israel, there are things about it that capture the imagination and stir the soul. Engaging Israel puts us into the land of the Bible, the land where Jesus was born and lived and died and was raised and will come again. Engaging Israel brings us to a focal point of world politics. This is the homeland of both the Jewish and the Palestinian peoples. This land stirs strong emotion in people far away. All of this makes it fascinating to engage with Israel. Israel's very complexity, though, can push us to narrow the scope of our engagement. Weariness and frustration with the political conflict lead some Christians to shrug their shoulders and sigh. What can you say? Other believers are thrown into combative fury by their indignation, anger, and wounded sense of justice. How can such a holy place be home to such suffering? Yet others look beyond the present to a passionate vision of the end times. These reactions represent several of the many paths by which one can engage Israel. And each one has its advocates, not only among Christians, but clearly also among Jews and Muslims and the Palestinians and Israelis who live in our communities in North America. Many of these people seek our support as they press their claims in regard to residency, statehood, justice, and dignity particularly in North America, where we only engage Israel from a distance and where others ask us to engage it on their behalf, the familiar paths seem irreconcilable. The result is that any path of engagement that we choose can be seriously challenged by those on another path. Join us as we seek new paths for engaging Israel. In our study together, we'll examine several of the most familiar paths for engaging Israel. We can't explore every path, but the ones that we do explore here will be some of the most familiar and well-traveled ones of recent times. We'll explore where these paths begin and how they empower us to engage Israel, each in its own way. We'll ask where they begin and see how they lead us toward Israel. We'll also ask about their limitations, the things they bypass and leave out of account, or just the places at which they run out of steam as they try to lead us into an engagement with Israel. In this way, we'll become more self-aware about our own preferred path and how it leads us to avoid certain places and facts. It will empower us to encounter those people and facts more fully. And through the self-awareness and the empowerment, we'll broaden and deepen our understanding. And we'll ask ourselves all along the way what else we need to know to be prepared to take a new path for engaging Israel so that we will not again end in pitched conflict or exhausted frustration or simply awestruck wonder. If that seems like a tall order, we agree. And we think it's worth the effort. So let's see where we'll begin. The first familiar path that we'll follow is one that leads to Jerusalem, the city of peace and the Prince of Peace. It's the path where we come to the land of Jesus, the place that has brought pilgrims since ancient times, and that still brings eager world travelers today. It's the land of Jesus. It's the birthplace of the Christian church. It's the place to which Jesus will return. Our second path actually leads away from Israel in a sense, because it's a path that follows the Jews into their exile and dispersion after the Romans destroyed their temple in the year 70 of the first, first century of the Common Era. This is a path on which Christians honestly have hounded Jews mercilessly, violently for centuries. It's one in which Christians have denied Jews any sense of homeland or peoplehood. 
The third path is the one that Jews themselves carved out in their exile, in their liturgy, in their study, in their building of community. They created a sense of Jerusalem even when it was a distant and impossible dream. This is the path that Jews, on which Jews long to return to the nation, in which they prayed to return to the nation, in which they built their peoplehood on study, on worship, and on decent life with one another. The fourth path that we'll follow is the one that was built as Israel did return to the land because it was not the same land that it had been two, 3,000 years before. In the meantime, an Arab, Muslim, and Christian population had grown and expanded and over the years had developed its own sense of being at home, its own sense of identity and place. Because Israel's return to this land and the Palestinian experience of that return involved multiple wars with Israel, this is a path that has been marked with stark bitterness for many people. All of these paths lead us to the modern state of Israel. This is the path that's charted by the Proclamation of Independence in which Israel's founders expressed the hopes and aspirations that they had for bringing the Jewish people back to history as a nation. These are the paths that we will explore together. These are the paths that will help us define our new paths for engaging Israel. Coming here and looking out over Jerusalem with its many historical layers and different communities, we realize that engaging Israel often leads Jews, Christians, and Muslims into conflict among themselves and with each other. That can arise simply because of traveling different paths and having different companions and experiences. Simply identifying with one perspective or community and taking up their approach, though, is not necessarily the most constructive way to engage. As Bishop Elias Shakur of the Galilee has said, None of us in Israel needs one more enemy. What we all need is one more common friend. If we look at a biblical example, when Paul was concerned about a community in serious conflict at Corinth, he resolved to go see them and to spend time with them in their conflict in order to understand the complexity of their situation. I intend to pass through Macedonia, he wrote, and perhaps I'll stay with you or even spend the winter with you, for I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. Spending time, moving in, making a commitment to live inside the complexity, that's how one engages constructively. When God seeks to engage us meaningfully, God comes into the complexity of life to spend time, move in, make a commitment to live among us. Even the resurrected Jesus continues to engage as he breathes his spirit on the disciples, as he goes before the disciples to Galilee, as he has promised that having gone away, he will come again. So also, we will seek out the realities of Israel and seek to immerse ourselves, to spend time, to move in. When we want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we have to make a commitment to invest ourselves in its complexity. Since we're not directly involved or responsible, we're not the ones who will solve the many issues that Israel faces, even though we are implicated in those problems as Christians and as North Americans. If we want to engage Israel responsibly, we shall have to see ourselves and Israel and others who are engaged as clearly as possible in all our complexity. There's an old rabbinic tale about a disciple who repeatedly told his rabbi that he loved him. 
day and night, traveling with him, studying with him, eating with him, over and over the disciple would say, Rabbi, you know that I love you. One day the rabbi turned to the disciple and asked, do you know what hurts me? No, said the student, how can I know what hurts you? The rabbi replied, and how can you love me if you do not know what hurts me? Along the paths that we explore lie not only memories and hopes and aspirations, but also pain and fear. If we would be peacemakers, it may be more important to know the fears than anything else. When we live in fear, every tool is potentially a weapon, and anyone who approaches us is potentially a threat. The tools may be as simple as language and education. It's easy to see the dynamic of fear at work, in the way that words and images, memories and history, even scripture and school books are made into weapons so that they ratchet up the fear. But we know from the first letter of John in the New Testament that perfect love casts out fear. As we seek new paths to engage Israel, one of the key tests of newness will be the degree to which we are able to lessen fear, or at the very least, not to increase it. That will mean coming to understand what hurts a person and causes fear. Then we can address it in the perfect love that casts out fear. It means as much as possible engaging in such a way that others will see us and understand that they shouldn't fear us as yet another enemy, nor fear that we would betray them. And the easiest betrayal comes from ignorance. Walking this new path is a tall order. To become an authentic and dependable peacemaker takes time. It takes investment in the situation. But only as we're able to help cast out fear will we be able to engage Israel in all its messy complexity and hope to be a constructive presence. Here's what we'll do together. We will seek to deepen our insight first into the paths that are most familiar but have not yet led to peace. Then together, we'll find a new path as companions and partners with all who are part of Israel, praying for fulfillment of the great biblical vision in which God's teaching goes forth from Zion and God's word from Jerusalem to bless all the peoples gathered there and indeed throughout the world. Come and join us as we seek out new paths for engaging Israel. Thank you.